Your window of opportunity is opening, but is your business ready for what's coming? Be good surprises and bad surprises ready. Be new markets, no problems ready. Be pay family leave ready. Be ready with SAP. Visit sap.com slash be ready. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II podcast, episode 401, interview with Brad Meltzer and Josh Mensch about their book, The Nazi Conspiracy. And the second episode is from our regular series. In this one, Montgomery finally makes an appearance. For the first episode, New York Times bestselling authors Brad Meltzer and Josh Mentz are here with their latest offering. After writing The First Conspiracy and then The Lincoln Conspiracy, they are back with one of the greatest what-ifs of history. Namely, the assassination of FDR, Stalin, and Churchill, for that is what Hitler had ordered to salvage his war effort. The tension builds as the main players all arrive in Tehran, but only the killers know what's going to happen next. And then for the second episode that continues the main storyline, Churchill gives British Eighth Army to Montgomery. Mr. Meltzer, Mr. Mensch, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, so good to be here. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to this because um, I don't know what working process you have. Uh, I know you've worked together for a while, and so you probably got that ironed out. But whatever you did made this book an absolute joy to read. The tension did not ever stop building up. And I already know the outcome. I know what's going to happen, but it didn't matter because it was so amazing. So I just wanted to ask, how did a book like this come about? Because obviously it's the story of two Western leaders, a dictator, but they've all got it work somehow work together because they have a common enemy. And of course, this enemy is going to try to end all of their lives because they find out about a certain meeting in the future. So if you could for me, uh, tell me how this book came about. So this is Brad, just so you can separate myself mm-hmm. from Josh. Um, you know, I don't think the internet is good for many things uh, these days, but uh, it was good for finding this his, uh, obscure historical story. Right. And I found this story, it was truly like a half page, barely a page article, page mm-hmm. article on uh, the internet that said there was a, a plot to kill Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and FDR at the height of World War II, and the Nazis were going to try a, a triple assassination. And I was like, is that true? Is it real? What is it? Right. And, um, and that's where the book kind of began for us. And, and this, you know, this moment where it, it's the moment just to paint the picture and set us up. Mm-hmm. It's right in 1943, we're at the height of the war. Joseph Stalin really wants us to invade continental Europe because the Nazis have, of course, invaded the Soviet Union, and he's getting pummeled. Right. And we, as the United States, start sending weapons and uh, and things like that, but he wants us to actually invade. Mm-hmm. And this is the moment where the big three need to get together, meet face-to-face for the first time, discuss logistics, discuss troop movements, discuss even morale and support. And the stakes are so high, the meeting must take place. And... FDR, as you said, is the middleman because Churchill and Stalin hate each other. Right. And in that moment, you have Winston, you have, uh, Winston Churchill arrives in Tehran because it takes place in Tehran is where the meeting is, where Stalin insists. Mm-hmm. And FDR arrives and the motorcade's going down the center of the city and everyone's waving. Um, and president waves back from the right. car. But in reality, what no one knows is that's not the president. <laughs> right. The pre- that, that's a decoy. That's a Secret Service agent pretending to be FDR. The real FDR is across the city, ducked down in the back of a beat-up sedan, and he's hiding because they're worried someone's going to kill him. And I just ruined chapter one of the Nazi conspiracy. (laughs) No, no, That's where it begins, so I'll leave it at that. No, that was brilliant. You set it up perfectly because, as you allude to, this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, what could have been in history. Like you said, the war is at its peak. It's just starting to turn. Things are starting to go the Allies' way, but not without some severe suffering on their part. The big three have to get together. They have to plan things out. But if something had happened to them in Tehran, I mean, the devastation of morale, the people, the troops. I mean, FDR has been the president since some people can can quite honestly remember. And so it would have been a big deal. And so this, I guess this is um, maybe Hitler's 
attempt at, look, things aren't going my way in the war, but if I can take these three guys out, maybe we can turn it around. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's as you said, it's an incredible what if. And of course, we'll never possibly know how history would have changed had right. uh, this, you know, potential assassination plot been successful. Uh, it killed even just one of the three allied leaders, let alone all three of them. Absolutely. Uh, we'll never know. As you said, militarily, the war was going the allies way, but it was such an epic and complicated conflict that something as massive as you know, the assassination of one of these leaders, it could have just been a game changer. And who knows um, the ripple effect such, a, a, you know, a, a massive event would have on everything else that was going on. Absolutely, because there's a very delicate balance. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut someone off if I did. Oh, no problem. No, no, Josh and I try and answer every question. We we go one, then the other. Uh -huh. and even if we're completely unprepared to answer that question, we go for it anyway. <laughs> that's that's how I operate. Yeah, yeah. So so, so we're going to jump into this, but I just have to say this, and I know you've heard this a billion times, and I apologize, but as the reader, you did such a great job. First, you tell this little bit of a story, and then you tell, then you jump and you go over here, and then you go over here. But overall, the net effect is you're moving the story forward. The tension is building. You're like, oh my god, what's going to happen? So first of all, I just wanted to say, as someone who read this, you know, on, on this side of the book, I absolutely love the build up attention. So uh, again, I just want the readers to know that this this is going to tease and torment you throughout the entire book, but in a good way. So so let's jump into this. So all the combatants in the war, as in any war, they have spies all over the place. And one of those places, and you were just alluding to this a, a second ago, was Tehran uh, called Persia back then. But uh, Persia is not in the war, but it is vital to the Allies because that's where a lot of the Lend-Lease materials are going from the U.S., from L London to Russia, and they're using that to take on the uh, the Germans because they're doing the, the vast majority of the fighting. So that brings us to two important German characters, Franz Mayer and Roman Gamotha, if I'm saying that right. Could you introduce them to the story, please? Sure, absolutely. So Franz Mayer mm -hmm. uh, and Roman, they're basically two Nazi spies. And when the start of the war happens and, and Iran is under, uh, eventually becomes under the Allies rule what, uh, mm -hmm. and we take over uh, there, or I should say the Soviet Union and, and the British take over there, mm -hmm. what happens is, is um, the, one of them quits and Franz Mayer is like, I'm going underground. <laughs> right. And he's basically a Nazi spy who, you know, he's, he's in his late 20s. He's a kid. Yeah. And the truth is everyone in Berlin, they forget about him. They think he's dead. They think, you know, they must have gotten him. They must have grabbed him. Right. But for two years, he's basically built an, under, an underground network of Nazi spies, finding people in Tehran who are, uh, you know, sympathetic to the Nazi cause, building this group of, of allies for himself. And he eventually gets word back to Germany to say, hey, listen, I, I got a group here. Mm -hmm. I got a landing zone if you want to put paratroopers here. Here's a drop zone. Here's where you can send me supplies. Here's where you can send me money. And he even gives them a secret code, that something that they can play on the radio so he, they can verify uh -huh. that he's actually, you know, they're going to send what he wants them to send. And when that happens, for the Germans, they get the best thing that anyone gets in a fight, mm -hmm. an opportunity. And they're right. like, oh, my gosh, we've got a guy on the ground. And, and now here's all this important stuff happening and going on. And so what they do, and, and maybe I'll let Josh take this part over just so I don't ramble so long, is um, – but they decide eventually to start sending people uh, in Operation Friends, and they send six paratroopers over. And, and I'll, I always feel like when I talk too long, it gets boring. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh so he can finish and go on. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, yeah, so so as Brad said, there's this kind of underground spy Nazi spy cell in Tehran, mm -hmm. and meanwhile that region is getting more and more important because, as you said, there's a key railroad that's going through there where the the U.S. and and Great Britain are sending supplies to the Soviet Union, which is absolutely critical in, in that war. Uh, and also, it turns out that uh, the city of Tehran is to be. Uh, the location for uh, this absolutely epic uh, first ever in-person summit meeting between the three uh, allied leaders, uh, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. And so, you know, when Nazi intelligence learns about this meeting, uh, they say, well, we already have this network in Tehran underground. 
Uh, we already have a way to send supplies there and send weapons there. Mm -hmm. We know how to send paratroopers. So it creates this, as Brad said, an opportunity. Uh, you've got the three allied leaders all in the same city at the same time, and you have a pre-existing kind of infrastructure for Nazi agents to operate in the city. So that's kind of... Um, you know, the, 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 the setting and the context for, for the story we tell uh, of this summit meeting. Right. Now, what, what makes this, well, there's a lot of things that make this fascinating, but what, what's that saying? Um, good luck is the residue of hard work. So you've got Franz who, like you said, Berlin thought he was, you know, it's been two years. No one's heard from him in two years. And so he finally comes back. They, they see, they find out that he's got a network, which is great because it's not, impossible for either Tehran or for Iran, uh, the larger country uh, in general, to turn against the allies because they are being occupied. No one enjoys being occupied. And so it goes from, well, maybe we can turn the Iranians to let's sabotage the uh, rail lines to, oh my goodness, all three of the major leaders are going to be here at the same time. This is something we have to take advantage of. And because of Franz, this might actually be possible. But so I wanted to ask, so Franz is the sword of the ally uh, of the axis. So let's bring in the American shield to counter him. Could you introduce us to Mike Riley, who worked for FDR? And I don't think I truly appreciated all the things that he had to deal with just because the president was bound in a wheelchair. Mike Riley uh, is, uh, you know, a person maybe who's not uh, a household name or even really well known to historians, right. but he was the head of uh, uh, FDR's Secret Service. Uh, he got the job the day after Pearl Harbor uh, because, you know, after Pearl Harbor, of course, the United States goes into sort of red alert mode. Mm -hmm. And there was actually fear after Pearl Harbor that the Capitol could be attacked. Right. And so, you know, the kind of old stodgy guard at, at the Secret Service suddenly didn't seem up to the job. And so <laughs> FDR wanted to bring in some, you know, someone with a youth and energy to kind of take over. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, he picks this guy, Mike Riley, who's like a former, you know, football player from, uh, I, I'm not forgetting where, from South Dakota, I, I think it is. And um, and he's this kind of burly, burly guy, not right. super well educated, but the two of them kind of form a bond and, and FDR implicitly trusts him. And so, you know, this relatively young guy is thrust into this position of incredible responsibility because suddenly, you know, it's wartime and the president has to start traveling a lot right. and he's wheelchair bound. And Mike Riley is the guy who has to figure out how to safely transport him uh, by car, by train, and uh, eventually by plane um, to uh, different countries, different states. And in, it's incredibly complicated, incredibly stressful. And uh, Mike Riley ends up being the guy sort of in charge of the president's safety during this trip from the United States to Tehran, which mm -hmm. at that time was a two week journey uh, that involved, you know, ships, planes, trains, automobiles, <laughs> you name it. Uh, so he's the guy that uh, is sort of responsible for the president's safety right. when they arrive in Tehran and learn, oh, yeah, there's also uh, a potential assassination plot to kill, to kill FDR. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, good luck with that. Right. I also just love when something happens, you know, they say to Mike Riley or even to the secretary of state, they're like, you know, go ask Stalin this question. And he's like, OK, boss, I'll be back in a month. <laughs> and like it takes a month. He like, you know, it takes two weeks for Cordell Hill to go over, you know, and. And then you ask Stalin a question, then you come back and, and right. a month has passed. And he's like, he says no. Oh. Like, okay, ask him this. And he's like, I'll be back in another month. And and that's just, you know, in, in the world of Zoom where the three of us are on a Zoom together right, right now. Yeah. It is spectacular to me. I can only imagine the frequent flyer miles he would have earned had they had them, <laughs> but whatever. So 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 let's let's jump into this. Let's let's ramp up the intensity. So you've got this special six-man team uh of, of Nazi guerrillas. In Tehran, they're setting up. They're trying to do their thing. They're they're, they're working with a with a mayor to try to learn the the layout. But let's bring in the big guns. Let's let's bring in the ace. Can you tell us about Scorzani and tell us of some of his exploits and why he eventually gets tapped uh, for this assignment? Yeah, Otto Scorzani is probably my favorite bit player right. in terms of you know the, the on the craziness meter, and he's a Nazi uh, special operations guy. Mm -hmm. Who Hitler brings to he Hitler's basically bringing together all of his special operations guys to kind of find the best fighter. Right. And what he does is he invites them all to the Wolf Slayer to his his secret headquarters, mm -hmm. lines them up in the big room shoulder to shoulder, 
And Adolf Hitler poses this question to him. What do you think of Italy? And all of them start kind of kissing the boss's rear end and saying, oh, Italy's on our side and we stand strong together. Right. And Otto Skorzeny in that moment blurts out above everybody, I am from Austria, mein Fuhrer. Ooh. And he's gambling there because yeah. what Otto is gambling is he knows, of course, that Adolf Hitler is from Austria. Mm -hmm. And any real Austrian hates Italy on some level because during World War I, right. Italy took a key piece of Austria and never returned it. Yeah. And that's what Otto's banking on. And Adolf Hitler turns to him and basically is like, you're my guy. Yeah. And what happens next is Adolf Hitler sends Otto Skorzeny on the craziest rescue mission. I don't want to ruin this part completely, but on the sure. craziest rescue mission that when you get to it in the Nazi conspiracy, you're going to see, you know, Nazis raining from the sky in gliders. They, they're predicting an 80% fatality rate. It's a wow. giant disaster. They're, they're plummeting from the sky into like the tops of mountains. And when you see it, you're going to be like, is this real? And Josh and I actually asked our editor yeah. that we need to buy a photograph so we can put an actual photo of this moment in the book mm -hmm. because no one's going to believe that this really happened. And what's funny is my 21-year-old son is reading The Nazi Conspiracy right now. Right. And he's like, Dad, this part without a Scorsetti. I'm like, I know. And he's like, this is real. I'm like, yup. And he's like, you're telling me it's real. I'm like, turn the page and look at the photo. And he turns the page. He's like, oh my gosh, this really happened. And it's the craziest Nazi story that you've never heard in your life. Exactly. It, it, but if I could, this is um, not only is it daring and not only is it tension filled, which I enjoyed very much, but it sets up the idea, the concept, the the and, and it expands the boundaries that Hitler is capable of thinking way outside the box. And so when you take an, an incredible rescue like this, and you mix it with the fact that the Americans opened up the Pandora's box by killing Yamamoto, it's not so far-fetched that Hitler might go, you know what, if all three of those guys are going to get together and they're my nemesis, I want someone to find a way to wipe them all out. Yeah, no, and I yeah, think, and I, sorry, go ahead, Josh. Go ahead, Brad, go ahead. No, I was just going to say quickly, I think you're mm -hmm. just hitting on the point, one minor point here. Yeah. is we were using um, assassination as a weapon, right? right? I mean, whether it was Yamamoto and killing Admiral Yamamoto, the architect of Pearl Harbor, um, in an assassination when, when they said, should we kill him? The quote that FDR said was, get Yamamoto. Yes. And of course, there were attempts against Hitler, and, and now there's an opportunity here. It, this is just, it would be a tantalizing weapon to be able to take out the big three. Right. Yeah, the only thing I was going to say was really what Jet, Brad just said, which is uh, it, it's it's it was there's a, anyone who would say, well, it's unrealistic that you know that a, a, a world power you know would resort to assassination of mm -hmm. you know other world leaders. It's it's just simply not the case. Assassination was absolutely on the table um, uh, during this war. There are many examples of it, and uh, and there was certainly uh, the the. Uh, the motive for for Hitler to want right. to uh, get rid of these three world leaders, and there was uh, certainly the opportunity, uh, and, and there was a, a history of assassination in the war. So um, mm -hmm. anything was on the table, really, for any of them. I mean, the stakes of this why war were so high that anything uh, w was was possible, and 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 something like assassination was clearly in the realm of possibility. Right. Because if you think about it, I mean, when you have war, you literally have the the breakdown of society, of civility. And so, yes, we make up rules for war, but it's war. And so the winner gets to write the history. And so, yeah, whatever you can do to win, that's what you should do. Now, out of all of the things in this book that I enjoyed very much, and you've got like, of course, you've got multiple storylines running because that's the way history works. But I was hoping you could kind of paint me a picture because uh, one of you mentioned earlier that Churchill and Stalin, they don't like each other. They've never liked each other. They've said horrible things about each other. They don't trust each other. That makes sense. One is in the Western government and the other one's a dictator. But uh, FDR sees that, one, the three of us need to meet because the PR potential alone will be staggering. Plus, we have to work out our military priorities, you know, some very real world um, things that are going on. But if you could give us a sense of how FDR was slowly, gradually, over time, able to pull 
Stalin into agreeing to see them because Stalin's a busy man. He's fighting the Germans practically on his own in the Eastern Front, and he doesn't really have a lot of time to play. He doesn't do small talk, but FDR slowly gets him to say, yes, I will meet with you. Yeah, it's it's one of the most fascinating parts of, of, of researching this story is just reading the letters, uh, the cables between mm. the three world leaders, and mm -hmm. they're constantly, you know, sending messages to each other. And uh, it's such a long effort on FDR's part. Uh, Stalin says no about a hundred times before he finally says yes. Right. Um, but Roosevelt just felt it was so important for them not just to communicate, but to get together in person. And as you said, there were two dimensions to it. I mean, there were many dimensions to it, but the two key aspects of it were uh, one, he felt that if he could get Hitler and Stalin and himself in the same room, that they could really, that he and Churchill. Stalin could really, really pressure Churchill right. to finally agree to go forward with, you know, what they were calling the cross-channel attack, which, you know, would, would turn into what we we know as the Normandy invasion. Right. Because um, Churchill was dragging his feet on it. He was saying he was going to do it, but then not doing it. Uh, Stalin was getting increasingly impatient and frustrated with the other two because they weren't committing to this attack. They weren't giving a date. They kept delaying it. Mm -hmm. And so FDR thought the only way to really make it happen would be to get the three of them in the room together and sort of force the issue. Right. Uh, and secondly, FDR had also learned the incredible importance of sort of international press and propaganda. And they had had a previous more uh, international meeting between himself and Churchill in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. right. And that was kind of a PR coup. Uh, and it was it really created a lot of uh, enthusiasm on the Allied side. It really helped the cause, um, not just because of the strategy they discussed, but because the photographs of him and Churchill were broadcast all over the world. And it was, you know, mass media was still a relatively new thing at that time. And right. it was really effective. And he thought, wow, if, we, if I can do that with Churchill, if we can get the three of us, Stalin, oh. Churchill and myself uh, together and get yeah. a photograph that's broadcast on every, you know, that's on the front page of every newspaper around the world mm -hmm. would be incredible for the Allied morale and really quite devastating uh, to the Axis morale because the Axis was always sort of hoping that that alliance would fall apart. So he yes. really had a vision for this summit. Before we return to Tehran, I just want to stick with this for just a moment, because what happens in the book, I'm a big fan of Churchill, I'm a big fan of FDR, and this is the part of the book where FDR has to turn away from Churchill. He's like talking to Stalin, Churchill doesn't know about it, he's got a, you know, it's almost like there's a three of us who are really good friends, but I'm going to ignore you for a while, and I'm going to hurt your feelings, and I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing, or why, and I'm going to focus on Stalin, so... You're right. FDR does a brilliant job over time of slowly bringing um, uh, Stalin to saying yes. But one, they have to decide where. And two, the um, the almost the ganging up of Churchill isn't going to stop during this correspondence. It's going to go on during the meeting, but we might leave that for the readers. But I just I just found it one of those points in history where these two gentlemen who really have been getting along, they've met a couple of times, they seem to respect each other, but FDR knows what he has to do. He has to temporarily cut out his friend, his partner, to focus on Stalin, because Stalin is the one guy that they really need to make this work. So I just, I just wanted to let you know that that part of the book was beautifully painful for me to read, because you can just see what FDR is doing, and it's something that he has to do. Absolutely. You put it very well. So the Allies are still hunting down the Nazi agents in Tehran because, of course, they either know about them specifically or they just assume that they're there because that's what you do. You have spies all over the place. And at some point, they get a massive break. So what I love about this story is we all know Winston Churchill. We all know FDR. We all know Joseph Stalin. Those are the big players. Mm -hmm. And then as in any story and in any movie, um, there are the small players, but they, they serve no less importance, really. Right. And this one is almost like uh, you couldn't make it up. And what happens is you have uh, the, the British grab uh, a couple people who lead them to what I'm going to call the most famous dentist in World War II. <laughs> right? I mean, it's truly this guy is – he happens to be – the oh. uncle of Lily Sangari, which means nothing to anyone, so let's break down who he is. Right. Brown's mayor, the Nazi spy who we spoke about, mm -hmm. is dating a girl named Lily Sangari. That's the, the love of his life. He's in love. 
Yes. He's in love. Yes. The Nazi is in love with this local woman from a wealthy family. Right. Um, the great part of that are, is twofold. One, Lily Sangari is sleeping with an American intelligence <laughs> officer. So mm-hmm. everything he's whispering to her, she's whispering back to us. Oh. And in the midst of that, as if this Three's Company episode <laughs> could not happen better, um, the British capture a dentist who happens to be Lily Sangari's uncle right. who says – my niece is dating someone you're going to want to speak to. Wow. And it sounds like a silly game of telephone mm-hmm. that winds up again being this incredible opportunity for the British who race in, find a day later, um, mm-hmm. they find Franz Mayer. They confront and say, are you Franz Mayer? And Franz Mayer, in that moment, the bold Nazi spy right. falls to the ground because at that moment he faints. He's a lover, not a fighter like he, me. Truly, that's the line. <laughs> Josh, by the way, that's the line we missed in the book. We should have said at that moment, he's a lover, not a fighter. That is absolutely – the Nazi conspiracy paperback is going to have one oh, the extra. Next, yeah, the next edition, yeah. So so, so, they, so the British were able to – and the Americans were able to find out so much. But, but it's bad. It's like, oh, my God, this has been going on under our nose this entire time. And it's about to get worse because the Germans, uh, as far as intelligence, they get their own – big break. Yes. And and this is another one of these things where it's just amazing that we don't all know this story because it's so sensational and just seems like a, a, such a Hollywood movie kind of story. Yes. Yes. Um, And uh, you know, it's probably the third or fourth kind of little mini story that we encountered uh, while, you know, researching and writing this book that Mm -hmm. we just couldn't believe we hadn't heard before. Um, But uh, (laughs) in Turkey, Right. Um, there's a British amb- ambassador and Turkey is an, an important country uh, in some of the negotiations in the war. And, and both sides are trying to get Turkey on their side. Mm-hmm. And there's a British ambassador in Turkey, of course. Um, and the British ambassador gets a new valet who uh, is, you know, a local, a local person right. and, you know, to work for him. And this valet decides that he's kind of disgruntled with the role of the British in Turkey at that time and the role of the allies uh, in Turkey at that time and decides that, you know, he's going to do something about it. And he realizes that he has access to the British ambassador's secret files. Mm -hmm. You know, he's getting the British ambassador's clothes ready uh, and he's ironing his shirts (laughs) um, um, and sort of, you know, getting his briefcase ready for his meetings. And he's seeing all these top secret documents and so oh, wow. in this just kind of extraordinary act of, of you know, I don't know what you want to call it, daring, uh, mm-hmm. but but uh, definitely risking his life uh, and seeing an opportunity, he starts photographing these top secret allied documents and then sort of goes to uh, a, a local person who's in touch with sort of Nazi uh, uh, officials there mm-hmm. and says, I got some documents that I can sell. Right. To Nazi intelligence that they're going to be really interested in. And it's just a crazy story. And it, it happens. He, uh, you know, that this yeah. the, the Nazi intelligence in Berlin learn about this guy and they realize that it's an incredible opportunity. And so they're ready to put up the money. And so this really complicated transaction occurs where um, uh, the British, I mean, the Nazi Foreign Intelligence Service is sending money to Turkey so that this valet can get paid to send photographs of these, you know, incredibly top secret documents. Wow. And through that, um, now we don't know exactly what is in these documents or we only sure. know what's exactly in some of them because only a few of them have survived. But there's it's, it's almost without question that there would have been a lot of talk about this meeting uh, between the big three because it was in the weeks prior to it. And mm-hmm. Turkey was one of the key subjects that was going to be taking, you know, talked about at this summit in Tehran. And so basically Nazi intelligence uh, learns about the location of this three-way summit wow. uh, that will to take place in Tehran, yeah. all because of this uh, sort of disgruntled valet of a British ambassador in uh, in in Ankara, Turkey. So yeah. it's again just one of those amazing stories from World War II that's largely forgotten. But uh, you know, there it is. That's yeah. that's you know one of the ways that that the uh, Nazi intelligence forces learn about uh, this this summit and coming summit right. in Tehran. 
I just have to say real quick, that's why I'm always nice to my valet. Just it's just it's just a policy that I have. You know, these okay. people have access to everything in your life. Just just be nice to them. I hope you gentlemen do the same thing. I will tell you that my son, my 21 year old, when he read that scene, he was describing it to my wife at the dinner table. And he says, oh, and then there's this Nazi, uh, there's this guy who's working and he drives this this British ambassador's car. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, the valet. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's not. No, it's not his driver at the restaurant. It's not the valet. I'm like. So I love that. Uh, you speed reading. That teenager <laughs> spoke. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It just was spectacular work by us. <laughs> oh, and I'm glad I'm recording this because I want it on the record. If and when you two write the script, you have to bring me in. I'll, I'll be your valet. I'll be your chauffeur. I'll carry the luggage, whatever. But I would <laughs> love to be on the set of something like this. This would, because I, I interviewed the gentleman from uh, the, the Battle Midway. And, uh, I mean, just giant toys. If y'all make a movie, I just want to be there just to watch this thing unfold. I, it would be, it would be incredible. So everybody's learning about everybody. The, the, the Axis is learning that the Allies are going to get together. The Allies have got uh, Mayor. You know, they've got it because he faints, and so that he's he's spilling the beans, as it were. And so everybody is starting to learn everything. And yet, the big three are coming to Tehran. This is going to happen. Uh, But um, I just wanted to see it. I know it's been a little bit of a while, but I'm going to let you two gentlemen determine how far, because you want to keep, this is an incredible story. You want to keep it uh, for the readers. You want to get to get to the end like I did and go, oh my God, this is amazing. But if you could give us an idea of maybe some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes, some of the smaller parts of it, whatever you want to do. But but we do have to acknowledge that this is FDR uh, at his the top of his game, at least uh, internationally, bringing this wartime conference together. It is a big deal, but it, at the same time, it might all come undone if Hitler and his uh, special forces have their way. Yeah, and I think for us, what mm-hmm. was so striking is, you know, we we love in America to tell the story that we came in and we punched the Nazis in the jaw and we saved the day for democracy. Right. And it's a wonderful story, but it's just, it was never a foregone conclusion that we were going to win. Absolutely. And, you know, Josh and I have done a book called The First Conspiracy about the secret plot to kill George Washington. Mm-hmm. We did another one called The Lincoln Conspiracy about a plot to kill Abraham Lincoln at the start of his presidency. Right. And, of course, now the Nazi conspiracy. And, and the one thing I take away... Uh, is that when you want to know what a great leader is, mm-hmm. and now we've studied Washington, we've studied George Washington and, and Abraham Lincoln, is it's not that they make the best speeches, it's not the one who, who makes the best promises, right. but it's the person who, once they're elected, when a disaster strikes, can they pivot and adapt to that disaster? Uh, and as you said, what FDR is doing in this moment, he has faith in one thing and one thing, thing I feel like above all else, and it's his own ability to go on the charm offensive. He fully (laughs) believes that he is like, you know, I can handle Stalin because Stalin likes me better. Mm -hmm. And he charms Stalin. And and then he's like, you know what? Winston Churchill likes me better. I'm going to go charm Winston Churchill and bring him. At one point, he's lying to Churchill and, and trying to meet secretly with Stalin. Right. And over and over, what FDR is doing is, is just, again, has this faith in his own ability is and he's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And that's what struck me is he is the exact right guy for the job because it's so precarious. The big three being together looks like a great photo op, but it was so precarious. They were not on the same page. Churchill yes. is fighting and kicking and screaming one way. Stalin's making demands and, and challenging them in other ways. Um, but it takes this middleman of FDR to kind of bring everybody together. Wow. Yeah. If I could real quick, may I make the recommendation that your next collaborative book be something along the lines of the effects of charm throughout history? Because Caesar had charm, Alexander had charm, Napoleon had charm. I mean, these people were either able to defeat you militarily or they were able to wow you across the dinner table. So again, but but you're right. I mean, not only does FDR have a whole bunch of hope, which you could easily argue maybe he has too much hope. But the point is he has hope that he can work with Stalin, that he can work with Churchill, that he can bring them together. And again, I, I don't want to ruin too much, but FDR's plan does in the end work. He's able to bring Churchill um, 
to, to his idea. And, and they've been fighting over this since mid-1942, if I remember. So this is a big deal. So if nothing else happens in this conference, at least FDR got Churchill and Stalin to agree about you know, a cross-channel attack. So that's going to happen. That's the good news. But of course, then there's the ever-present six Nazi agents floating around Tehran somewhere. What's going to happen? How close are they going to get? What, you know, is anybody going to die? Again, the the ending, by, that, by this time, I'm like, oh my God, just someone tell me what's going to happen because the tension was that thick. Well, thank you so much for saying that. Um, sure. You know, uh, again, you, you know all about this war. Uh, so the fact that you felt any tension at all is um, is, is wonderful to hear. I also well, think what you're seeing is, yeah. you know, just to break down, because I think rather than just, you know, speaking about the, the plot of it all. Um, right. But I do think what you're seeing is is mine and Josh, and almost going back to your first question, kind of how do we pull something like this off? Yeah, it, it, you know, it's Josh's wonderful, incredible writing and researching that that obviously sets our entire pace. And I completely learned how to do nonfiction from Josh, and I hope what I brought uh, to it is is kind of that thriller side. I'm a thriller writer by training, right? Right. Um, and in, and and turning these things into, you know, how do we pace this so that even though you know what happens you're still going to be on the edge of your seat. And I remember, you know, for me, this is whatever you think of the movie Titanic, uh, obviously mm-hmm. it's been, you know, so talked about and, and overdone for right. all these years. But what's brilliant about Titanic is the moment we go into the movie, mm-hmm. you know what's going to happen. You yeah. know the ship is going down. And James Cameron does this brilliant thing at the very beginning of it where he shows you this 3D modeling of the ship going down and how it does this bob and then it cracks in half. Right. And then all you're doing, it's like a pin on the balloon, is go, goes back to the Alfred Hitchcock quote that I write my thrillers with, which it's not the bang that's scary. Mm-hmm. It's the anticipation of it. And the reason why you have that tension you're talking about, I hope, is because Josh and I work you know, to no small length to make sure that we start you with that, that moment where you know, Roosevelt is ducked down in the back of this car hiding. Right. And then we show you the Nazi that's, you know, with Hitler at the Wolf Slayer. And then we show you this other Nazi spy. That's the opportunity that the Germans have in Iran. And then we show you this dentist and we show you this woman, his niece, who's in love with, with Franz Mayer. And then we show you Mike Riley carrying FDR. And then we turn FDR and, and Churchill into human beings, not yes. encyclopedia entries, but flawed and proud and ego filled and, and real people. And suddenly this, this one-dimensional story that we kind of tell the same way over and over and over becomes a three-dimensional story mm-hmm. that has stakes and humanity and, 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 and you realize, oh my gosh, this almost went the opposite way. When you see that, there's a scene in the book where you see a, a Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden right. in New York City and it's 20,000 Nazis cheering. Uh, there's a giant banner of George Washington surrounded by swastikas. And the first speaker says that if George Washington was alive today, he'd be friends with Adolf Hitler. And and, and we put that in the book because the Nazi conspiracy is not just there to entertain you or to inform you, but it's also there to warn you. Yes. And, you know, when you look at the world we're living in today, it's, you know, World War II is not that long ago. That's why it's such an amazing story. And, and those became a, as vital to us as anything else when we put the story out there. That, that of course, gave it its own different form of tension. To echo what Brad said, that, mm-hmm. you know, as, as kind of entertaining as this story is, and as, as entertaining as it was to learn about and to write and sort of figure out and how to write about, um, we always did try to keep our eye on the bigger picture, uh, not just the bigger picture of the war militarily, but, you know, what was happening in the world and and the the fear and the terror uh, and the atrocities being committed, and that's ultimately what all of this is about. Um, was uh, the, you know the rise of this truly hateful ideology that was genuinely spreading and threatening to to in, sort of envelop the world, yes. and atrocities were already being committed uh, a, a, at an unspeakable scale. And we in our book we we really make a point to not just tell the fun spy story, but to constantly. Go, uh, you know, put, give the reader the context of what is really happening um, and not just the things that we already know, but some of the details that maybe aren't so well known uh, and, and to convey 
the horrors of the war and and the horrors inflicted on civilians in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's what gives meaning to everything that happens. Um, That's why the story is so exciting and, and, and so dramatic is because the stakes truly are as high as they've ever been in human history. Uh, not just because, you know, there's a war and one side wants to win, but because the, the degree of suffering and catastrophe uh, that Nazi Germany uh, uh, has inflicted. And of right. course, you know, the Pacific War is its own massive story uh, as well that we also touch on. So mm-hmm. we always try to balance those two things, the sort of you know, the, the fun plot, uh, sort of spy plot that we're telling with the bigger picture of the war. Um, and, you know, we feel if we can balance those two things and can keep that real, the moral component there um, and the sense of, of, of humanity suffering, then uh, then we can really enrich the story. Uh, and as Brad said, also just talking about the rise of Nazi Germany mm-hmm. uh, and 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 how kind of insidious that was. If we can get a, mix all those elements together, then you know hopefully that mix can really uh, get get readers interested in the story and 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 give them something to think about as well. Well said, because you're right. This isn't just well. Here, let me put it this way. So, uh, first of all, I, I want to encourage everyone to to get this book and check it out. But as far as what you gentlemen have done, Brad and Josh, you've you've told a story, you've entertained, you've informed, but like you were saying a second ago, you've also warned. And as far as I can tell, as someone on this side of the book who just got finished reading it, I would have to say mission accomplished. It was a great book. I enjoyed the story very much. There's a lot of little nuggets in there that someone like me who already knows the broad strokes of World War II go, oh, I didn't know that. So that so that was a lot of fun to pick those up away uh, along the way. So again, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. For the listeners out there, it's The Nazi Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today, and thank you for this book. Thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast. Episode 401, Churchill Gives British Eighth Army to Monty. Last time, the Americans and British had, more or less, worked out America's entry into the war it would be French North Africa, which meant, eventually, that both allies could crush Rommel between them. That is, if there was still an Eighth Army on the Egyptian border, when the Americans were ready. For Auchinleck knew he could not attack again until mid-September, and Rommel would himself attack way before that. But all these ideas of what to do went out the window on August 3rd. For that was the day that Chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Alan Brooke, arrived in Cairo with Churchill in tow. It would be during these meetings that the future of the Eighth Army was determined. As this was General Alan Brooke's meeting, he got it started with asking the three C&C's Middle East, Army, Air, Navy, should men be taken from Egypt to help bolster the rest of the Middle East commands? Or should they first focus on destroying Rommel, which would legitimately free up more men for other locations? However, he directed, if all else fails, that Rommel wins and the Soviets can't hold back the Germans in the Caucasus, then at the very least, the Abadan area, that is, that part of modern Iran that touches the top of the Persian Gulf, that has to be saved, so more men could eventually be disembarked there. But then Churchill jumped in and said, to his thinking, not one single soldier should leave this area until Rommel is defeated. Auchinleck was not crazy about this idea, and countered with, but what if I drive Rommel all the way back to Libya, and then the southern Russian front collapses? The enemy could still get into the Middle East regardless of Rommel. Churchill, who could have said much back to this, simply replied, Well, all will have to wait until I speak with Stalin and get a much better appreciation of the Caucasus. With that done, it was time for Brooke and Churchill to make a tour, put on a brave face, but most importantly, ask pertinent questions and try to figure out what was going on with Eighth Army. 
The answers to these questions were not surprising. A fresh breath of air was needed. Eighth Army was both baffled with and by itself, and there was no vigor. Churchill made the following proposals, and Brooke reluctantly went along with them. First, the C&C Middle East responsibilities were simply too vast. Persia and Iraq were cut away and to be called the Middle East Command. The rest of the old Middle East Command, Egypt, Libya, East Africa, Palestine, and Syria, would now be designated Near East Command. Next, per the Prime Minister, Auchinleck should go to the new Middle East Command as he had experience with India, and perhaps he could help there as well. And General Sir Harold Alexander would replace Auchinleck, now as the C&C Near East. Before this decision, Harold Alexander was to have been the British Task Force Commander for Torch. Now, that would go to Lieutenant General Bernard Law Montgomery, which left command of 8th Army to General Strafer Gott. Everyone in the meeting had confidence in Gott, even though he was heard to say more than once, that he was tired, and that new ideas were needed to win in this theater. But then fate stepped in. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity, when your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be good surprises and bad surprises ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there and can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. Be ready with SAP. Visit sap.com slash be ready. Just days after Churchill and Brooke had settled the major staffing questions, it was August 7th, that Sergeant Pilot Jimmy James, all of 19 years old, was waiting at the Berg El Arab landing strip, about 35 miles or 56 kilometers west of Alexandria. As such, the area was known to come under German air attack, thus Jimmy always kept his engine running when he stopped here to deliver mail and whatnot. But today, he was told to cut off his engine and wait. A VIP was on the way. Young Jimmy was not happy with this, but when he saw Strafer got himself pull up in a car, he guessed, that has to be my VIP. The two men then got aboard the Bristol-Bombay transport aircraft, and Jimmy told his Canadian co-pilot to keep an eye on the engines, as they had been running hot. When they were still only 50 feet off the ground, suddenly there was a loud bang, and the starboard engine came to a stop. Jimmy was about to cuss out his co-pilot for not watching out on the temperature when the man said, But look! Just then, machine gun tracers went flying by. Jimmy panicked, but then realized he was in charge. It was up to him if they were going to survive. Jimmy ordered the second pilot to go in the back and get the medical orderly, which is when the second engine stopped. The Bristol Bombay only has two engines. Jimmy pulled back on the throttle, climbing up to about 120 feet with the last of his momentum, which is when Jimmy saw at least two ME-109s out there. They passed by again, and this time they punctured his main fuel tanks in the high wing. They, Jimmy and company, were going down, no doubt about it. But that's when Jimmy spotted a desert slope on the other side of a hill with a gradual descent. Nothing for it. He force-landed the plane, sliding down on the far side of the naturally sandy surface. It could have been a lot worse. But it was the next pass by the Germans that busted the plane's main tank. A fire forced Jimmy to stay in the cockpit, where he could not tell if anyone else had gotten out safely. Jimmy eventually climbed out his shattered window, and when he rounded the plane, he expected to see 21 people waiting for him, for that was the amount of people that had taken off with Jimmy. Now, he only saw four. His wireless operator, badly wounded, the second pilot, a confused soldier, and the injured medical orderly. The doors had jammed on impact, and the others, if they were still alive, were trapped in the plane, which was ablaze. Jimmy tried to reach the door, but the heat was too much. It was then that he decided 
to go get help. He told the medical orderly to watch over the other three, and as he started walking away, Jimmy did not realize that his shoes and socks had been burned off, his hands were burned, and he had a bullet in his back, that it was only the adrenaline that was driving him on. The 19-year-old pilot would eventually collapse, but he was rescued by some Bedouins who took him to a British army camp. They followed him back to the downed plane. Jimmy would spend four months in the hospital, but more about him in the postscript. This tragedy of losing Strafer Gott was hushed over, but clearly 8th Army needed a new commander. Brooke went to bat for Montgomery, and Churchill, this time reluctantly, agreed with him. As for who should command the British forces working with the Americans during Torch, that would now be Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson. Auchinleck said no to Churchill's offer of the new Middle East assignment, but would go back to India as CNC in a few months' time. So the stage is set. Monty is on the scene and will be backed by General Alexander. But the great irony here is that Monty and Alexander will not have to constantly look over their shoulder to see exactly how angry Churchill was, as Auchinleck and others had had to do. Why? Because the Russians did hold on the Caucasus, thereby keeping the northern section of the Middle Eastern theater safe from invasion. This allowed Monty to focus on Rommel. Soon, c and Alexander and Monty arrived and got to work. They may not have been a dream team, but Alexander had a strong grasp of balancing the military with the political, and Monty liked to plan out his battles all the way until the end, even before the first shot had been fired. But most importantly to the men that worked under them, neither of these men liked wasting lives. For Alexander, it was moral. For Monty, it was a matter of efficiency. C&C Alexander and the 8th Army Commander Monty decided that first, they would have to raise the confidence of the army. Next, they would use that confidence to beat Rommel when he came this way again, which intelligence said would be on or around August 26th, during a full moon. And finally, they were to prepare for their own attack, to be called Lightfoot, which would be in coordination with General Eisenhower's torch. As for the building of 8th Army's confidence, Monty was in a bit of a pickle. What would help him was beating Rommel, yet confidence was needed to defeat him. It was a real chicken-and-egg situation. But for now, the best that Monty could do was talk to the men, explain to them what he wanted, and leave them with the impression, an air of someone, if you will, who knew what they were doing and what they wanted to accomplish. And this mostly worked, with much of the 8th Army saying, okay, let's give this guy a try. With this done, Monty then looked over Auchinleck's latest defensive dispositions. He did not like what he saw as it was the 30th Corps that would defend the northern half, namely from north to south, the 9th Australian Division, the 1st South African Division, and the 5th Indian Division, Monty noticed that they were all in defensive boxes, with an eye to successfully retreating, not successfully defending, and their overall defenses were too shallow, too easily overwhelmed and surrounded. No, what was needed was more men. One, to make those already there more confident, but also to have more of a defense in depth. The other mistake was the southern section, manned by 13th Corps. Here, the line was manned by, again, from north to south, the 2nd New Zealand Division on the Alam Nair Ridge, a smaller ridge below the Rui Sat Ridge, and below the New Zealanders were the two brigades, the 7th Motor and 4th Light Armored, of the 7th Armored Division. And not fearing to upset Churchill, as Auchinleck had been, Monty demanded more men from the Delta area. Some would go to the northern half to help bolster 30th Corps, but the majority of these new arrivals, that being the 44th Division, was to set atop the Alam Halfa Ridge, 
about three miles to the southeast of the Ruisat Ridge. This was agreed to, and so Monty laid down the law to 8th Army. First, we are here to win, not to hopefully win, but win. As such, all plans to withdraw from El Alamein were to be abandoned. We are not going anywhere. Next, every position is to be strengthened, and enough supplies to last for a while were to be put in place. And as the British wanted to attack in the future, for now, there was to be an operation and logistics balance. We plan to defend while we plan to prepare to attack. And as the entirety of the 44th Division was to sit on the Alam Halfa Ridge, when Rommel attacked, he was to be wiped out, not by Allied tanks, but by Allied anti-tank guns. The tanks were for attack. Next, 8th Army Headquarters was to move to Berg El Arab to be closer to the RAF, near the coast, making for better coordination. And the last of Monty's directive was simple enough. No more belly aching. Orders were orders, not suggestions. Get to it. Some of the soldiers were impressed by this determined man who used certain phrases over and over to push a point or an idea. Others were more cynical. Certainly, many of the New Zealanders, they would wait to see if the man's actions could match his words. All of this would amount to slow and steady wins the race, which was the exact opposite of Rommel's point of view. Time would tell who was right. Meanwhile, on Malta, the other half of the Mediterranean theater, in late July, Keith Park, Air Officer Commanding in Egypt took over for Hugh Pugh Lloyd on the island. Park had done much with his previous commands, getting them back into shape and back on the offensive. That, it was decided, was what Malta needed now. Until this point, though Malta had more Spitfires than ever before, Hugh Pugh had them stay on the defensive. Yes, the saved on fuel, but it also forced the island and its inhabitants to suffer ever more death and destruction. The first thing that Park wanted to do was take the fight to the enemy. And what Park had going for him at this point in Malta's history was its improved radar situation, its larger number of aircraft, and an air defense system that was working with three squadrons at any one time, offering up flexibility and punching power. Keeping it simple, Park ordered that when enemy planes were inbound, one squadron would make for the enemy fighters, flying higher up, hopefully with the sun behind them. The second squadron would go after those fighters much closer to the bombers, but if there were none, they were to go after the bombers themselves. And lastly, the third squadron would fly directly at the bombers, either forcing them to turn away while still 10 miles from the island, or dropping their payloads so they could get away faster. Either worked for Park. He just wanted Malta left alone. This forward interception plan of Keith Park's was implemented on July 25th. By the time that same month was over, daylight air raids of the enemy had come to a halt. Park also had the island's air-sea rescue arm strengthened, and lastly, the bombers of Malta were readied once again to take the fight to the enemy. Postscript, getting back to the 19-year-old pilot, Jimmy James, who had flown the plane that Gott was killed in, the young man spent four months in the hospital, but few people seemed to realize who he was. In fact, many thought he was dead as well. Even the RAF Air Historical Branch, this went on for decades as touching the historical branch. Six decades later, Jimmy was reading a book by a World War II German pilot, Herr Emil Claude. He wrote about shooting down a Bombay bomber at roughly the same time that Jimmy was shot down in the same general area. But Jimmy had been told that those two German pilots that shot Gott had been killed. In March 2005, the two pilots, Jimmy and the German pilot, finally met, and their stories were identical. 
But Klon added on, when he landed, his commander told him, Congratulations, you have just killed General Strafer Gott. In other words, the Germans had known about Gott's flight and targeted him. That's when Claude then asked how many others had died in the plane. Jimmy told him 18, and most of those was because of the second pass made by the Messerschmitts. Jimmy said to this, the other man started to cry. He cried for the dead and their families. He had just been following orders. Jimmy said he understood, and then, though they were in their 90s, they shared a flight together. <laughs> 